week six of the Gospel of John, volume two, and the title of today's message is Living as One in Christ. And this is the chapter where Jesus prays for us. And you know, it's so interesting because as I was studying to, to prepare for teaching this, I had always looked at this chapter as, you know, I, I knew that the central focus or the central heart of this prayer is that we would be one. If you read it, Jesus' heart and the Father's heart is that we would be one with them and one with each other. And I always looked at it like, when is this one with each other going to happen? Because there looked like there's so much division among us. There's so much, you know, different denominations and different ways of believing, and we're all seem to be separated. You know what I'm saying? You know, with the Catholics and the Baptists and the Methodists and the, you know, and it seems so like, and I would think, when is this going to happen? When are we going to really be one? When is Jesus' prayer going to be answered? And as I was reading and studying, the Spirit of God just showed me so clearly, Connie, the prayer has been answered. It was answered when Jesus died and rose again. And it's in believing what Jesus did that that oneness manifests. It's just like, you know, the Father is our healer. The Father is our strength. He's our peace. Jesus is our righteousness. But until we believe that, the manifestation of that doesn't come out in our life, does it? And it's the same thing with this prayer as I was reading it. It was like the Holy Spirit just showed me, wow, this prayer was prayed right before. It was the last recorded prayer of Jesus right before he went to the cross, right before he laid his life down. For us. And in this prayer, he is revealing the heart of the Father. He's revealing his heart for us. And so that's what we're going to be looking at this morning. We're going to start with John 17, and we're going to read verses 1 through 12. Jesus spoke these things and lifted up his eyes to heaven. He said, Father, The hour has come. Glorify your Son, that the Son may glorify you, even as you gave him authority over all flesh, that to all whom you have given him, he may give eternal life. This is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I glorified you on the earth, having accomplished the work which you have given me to do. Now, Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. I have manifested your name to the men whom you have given me out of the world. They were yours, you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they have come to know that everything you have given me is from you. For the words which you have given me, I have given to them, and they received them, and truly understood that I came forth from you, and they believed that you sent me. I ask on their behalf, I do not ask on behalf of the world, but of those whom you have given me, for they are yours, and all things that are mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I have been glorified in them. I am no longer in the world, and yet they themselves are in the world, and I come to you, Holy Father. Keep them in your name, the name which you have given me, that they may be one, even as we are. While I was with them, I was keeping them in your name, which you have given me, and I guarded them, and not one of them perished, but the son of perdition, so that the scriptures would be fulfilled." As I read this first portion of Jesus' prayer, the thing that stood out to me, that the Holy Spirit just shined the light on for me, was Jesus said, I have manifested your name. And he said, Holy Father, I pray that you will keep them in your name. And as I, as I thought, Lord, what, what are you saying here? What are you praying here? What does this mean? Keep us in your name. And so I went and looked up the word name. And the word name means implies it, it, in general, of the name by which a person or thing is called. He's surnamed. It's a surname. For all that a name implies of authority, character, rank, majesty, power, excellence, of everything that the name covers, the name of God as expressing his attributes. So Jesus prayed that he would keep us in 
the Father's name, the same name that the Father gave the Son. And the name of, of, of God, first of all, to us is Abba Father. He's our daddy, our daddy, our daddy God to keep us in that relationship. The whole reason why Jesus died and rose again was to reconcile us to himself, that we could live as one with him that we could live in peace as we understood his love for us and the Father's love. He said, I came to manifest your name. You know, in the very first chapter of John, when we started this study, Jesus said, I came to reveal you, Holy Father. I came to reveal who you really are. You've been, you know, people haven't understood who you are, but I came to the earth to manifest who you are. For when they see me, they see you. And the name of God, just think about it, you know, when we, if you read the scriptures, the names of God, and there are many that describe who God is. I mean, here are some of them that I wrote down in here. First of all, we know God is love. I mean, that, if you just need one word to describe the Father, God is love. He's love. And then you go, okay. Well, love. All of us sometimes are not sure what does love look like. True? Jesus manifested what love looks like. Some of the other names of God, El Shaddai, Lord God Almighty, Jehovah Nisi, the Lord my banner or my vic victory, Jehovah Ra, the Lord my shepherd, Jehovah Rapha, the Lord my healer. Jehovah Shema, the Lord is there. Jehovah Sidhanu, the Lord my righteousness. Jehovah, does anybody know how to pronounce this? Well, there you go. The Lord who makes me holy. Jehovah Jireh, the Lord my provision. Jehovah Shalom, the Lord my peace. Isn't that beautiful? This is the name of our Father. This is the name of our, of our God. He is our peace, our righteousness, the one who makes us holy, our shepherd. And Jesus came and he manifested every name of the Father. You know, I was thinking about when he fed the 5,000. He was manifesting the Lord is my shepherd. That's what he was manifested right there. The, the one who takes care of all your need. When Jesus looked at the adulterous woman who was caught in the very act of adultery, and he said, I do not condemn you. He was offering her righteousness. He was offering her acceptance and approval in the middle of her sin. He was manifesting the love of the Father. See, I don't understand anymore why people don't understand who the Father is. I don't understand why people think he's judgmental and angry and, and wants to judge sinners when Jesus looked in the face of a sinner and said, I do not condemn you. And Jesus said, when you see me, you see the Father. He manifested the name of our Father. When he looked in the face of the Samaritan woman who was rejected by society, judged by society, could you imagine the people talking behind her back, the gossip that went on about this woman who'd been married five times and was living with a man? Jesus looked in her face and offered her living water, offered her hand in marriage, his hand in marriage. He asked this woman to be his bride. This woman whom everyone else had rejected. This woman who everyone else had judged. This woman who everybody thought they were better than. Our Jesus manifested the name of our Father by saying, will you be my bride? I accept you. 
I approve of you. And you know that woman who was rejected by society and everybody and hid in her home, I'm sure, came in the heat of the day to get her water because nobody else would be there. But she didn't want to listen to the, the, the whispering. She just wanted to hide. After she encountered righteousness, love, peace, after she seen the Father in the face and the face of Jesus, she ran throughout the whole city. She didn't care anymore what anybody thought. She was in the name of the Father. She lived in the name of righteousness, in the name of peace, in the name of the one who made her holy. And she began to tell everybody, this man, he approved of me. This man, he made me, he offered me holiness and righteousness. This man, Jesus, who's going to die for our sins, make us holy. I mean, she went and spread the gospel that day and didn't care one iota what anybody thought of her because she was living in the name of the Father and in the Son because what they had named her, surnamed her, when you become a part of the family of God, when you become a son or daughter of God, your name becomes righteousness. Your name becomes approved. Your name becomes accepted. Your name becomes qualified and anointed and loved. I mean, do you understand your name? Keeping us in his name means, that's what he said, keep them in my in your name, so they may be one with us. So that they may be one with us. So that they may get their identity not from what the world says, but from who they are as a son, as a daughter of the king. Thank you, Jesus. Keep them in your name, Father, as you have given me your name. Jesus is saying, I have the same name as you, Father, and we're giving them the same name as us. Wow. How would your life change if you just, you know what? That's true of you, whether you ever believe it. See, that's what I was saying. It's like the Father has kept you in his name. No matter if you ever believe that you're righteous, no matter if you ever believed you're approved and accepted, you are. He's keeping you there. And you're staying there, and you ain't getting away. You belong to him. And he ain't never going to let you go. So let's just believe what he says. So that we can actually experience this peace. We can actually experience everything the Father is. Everything that Jesus is in us. Peace and righteousness and, and provision and healing we can experience it just simply by saying, Father, you are my healer. You are my provider. You are my approval. You are my acceptance. You are my peace. Have you ever been in a situation where you were feeling anxious and worried and fearful? Every single one of us have. Every single one of us have had some circumstance in our life that was like the storm. You know, the disciples? Here again, Jesus manifested the Father's name. They were in the storm all around him, waves crashing. Are you going to save us, Jesus? What are you going to... And Jesus manifested the peace of God, the peace of the Father. You don't ever have to be afraid. I am here. That's his name. I am am whatever it is you need. I am, the Father says, whatever it is that you need. Do you need a deliverer, a savior? A for, do you need somebody to, uh, to, uh, to accept and approve of you? Do you need provision, healing? Is your heart broken? Whatever it is you need, that's who I am so that we can live in peace in this world. So the first thing Jesus said is, I pray that you keep them in your name, Father. And then he says something 
I just, this really stood out to me too. John 17, 13. First of all, I want to read these scriptures. Psalms 27, listen to this. Some nations boast of their chariots and horses, but we boast in the name of the Lord our God. Some nations boast in their great mighty strength and their great mighty defense whatever <laughs> army but we boast in the name of the lord our god he is our banner he is our victory father you are our victory isn't that good now that is peace because he never fails our father never fails thank you jesus and this last one, as Proverbs 18.10, the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run into it and are safe. Wow. Thank you, Jesus. Jesus continues to pray. Verse 13, John 17, 13 through 19. But now I come to you, and these things I speak in the world so that they may have my joy made full in themselves. Now, I want to read this out of the Amplified Bible because it's just way better. John 17, 13 says, And now I am coming to you. I say these things while I am still in the world so that my joy may be made full and complete and per perfect in them that they may experience my delight fulfilled in them, that my enjoyment may, may be perfected in their souls, that they may have my gladness within them filling their heart. Jesus said, I'm saying these things, Father. I'm praying these things, Father. So that the result of what I accomplish on the cross will bring great joy and great delight and they will experience my joy in their heart. See, when you hear the good news, what does it, if you hear any good news, what, do you, what does it do to your heart? I mean, anytime we hear good news, we're like, yes! You know, joy comes to our heart. And that's how you know it's the good news. I mean, if, if this scripture has done anything for me, it has made me realize that if what I am hearing being spoken that's supposed to be the gospel is not producing joy in my heart, then it ain't the gospel. Because Jesus said he is the truth. He is the life, and he is the way. And he speaks these things so that we might experience gladness and joy filling our souls. And he only says what he hears the Father say. And so when you hear a message, if it's the true gospel, what's it going to produce in your heart? Joy. Not condemnation. Not, oh, I need to do this more, or I'm not doing that enough. Or No. It's going to point you to what Jesus did, and it's going to encourage you and persuade your heart to trust in the finished work of Jesus. Not in yourself. Amen? Amen? Amen. I say these things so my joy might be fulfilled in them. I've given them your word, and the world hated them because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I do not ask you to take them out of the world, but to keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. For their sakes I sanctify myself, that they themselves may also may be sanctified in truth. Okay, I want to read this out of the Message Bible. John 17, verse 15. I'm not asking that you take them out of the world, but that you guard them from the evil one. <laughs> they are no more defined by the world than I am defined by the world. Verse 19 in the New Living Translation says... And I give myself as a holy sacrifice for them so they can be made holy by your truth. Isn't that beautiful? The thing, again, I, as, I was, as I was thinking about Jesus saying, Holy Father, keep them in your name. Then the next thing he said, keep them from the evil one. So he was asking to keep us in, securely in, 
reconciled to the Father, knowing who we are, and to keep us from the evil one. Okay, my mind again went to Father, a lot. Okay, for example, what does the evil one do? He's the accuser of the brethren. We all read that in our Bibles. That's what he does. That's his nature, to accuse and to condemn God's people, that they are no good, that they need to do more, that they're, that they're inadequate, not important, not valuable, that somebody else is loved more than them. He goes around and he does that to anybody who will listen, right? Okay. In my mind, my simple mind, I say, Father, it doesn't look like this prayer is being answered. I see lots of your children who are not seeming to be guarded from the evil one. They're, acute, they're condemned. They're guilty. They're in shame. I mean, if you look at the body of Christ as a whole, they're still striving to be righteous when Jesus already made them righteous. They're just still striving to gain God's approval and acceptance when they already have it. True? So... Are you with me? It's like, okay, you pray, guard them from the evil one. Why does it seem like the evil one seems to be the one everyone believes? <laughs> you know? Anybody else wondered that question? <laughs> anyway, so I was looking at this and I had, you know, I was like, Lord, here we go again. And this is exactly where he showed me, Connie, this has already been done. This prayer has already been answered. And when he spoke that to me, immediately I went to Colossians. Immediately in my mind, the Holy Spirit took me to Colossians and showed me how this prayer that Jesus prayed to guard us from the evil one was accomplished on the cross. Now let's read it. Colossians 2, 13 through 16. You were dead because of your sins and because your sinful nature was not yet cut away. Then God made you alive with Christ, for he forgave all your sins. He canceled the record of the charges against us and took it away by nailing it to the cross. In this way, he disarmed the spiritual rulers and authorities. He shamed them publicly by his victory over them on the cross. So don't let anyone condemn you. So he guarded us from the accusations of the, of the evil one when he nailed them to all the accusations against us was nailed to the cross. He guarded us. Before that, you know, we, we were sinners. Right? If someone called you a sinner, yep. That's what the scripture says. We were sinners. But God made us alive in Christ. And so all the accusations of the evil one, everything, when he comes to you and says you're inadequate, you're not good enough, you're not accepted, nobody likes you. They're, it's just all lies. Jesus and the Father protected us and guarded us from those accusations by nailing every single one of them to the cross, making us righteous and holy in Christ. And now, if we will simply believe that, <laughs> it's pretty simple. If we would simply believe it. It's not, you know, we have the choice to believe. I'm bad, I'm good. I'm rejected, I'm accepted. I lack, I'm complete. One is an accusation and a lie that's been nailed to the cross. The other is the truth of what the Father and the Son accomplished in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ so that never, ever, ever do you have to listen to an accusation. When the enemy comes at you and says, you're no good, you're not a good mom. You're inadequate. You can't do it. You can't even stay focused for 10 minutes. <laughs> Whatever negative opinion or accusation he has of you, remember, you're in the name 
of Jesus. You're a son and daughter of the living God. And he nailed every accusation to the cross and made you righteous and holy. And so when the enemy says that, you say, no, no. I'm who my father says I am. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. I am approved and accepted in him. See, he guarded us. He kept us. And all we have to do is believe it. That's all. Just believe the Father's love. Believe what he accomplished at the cross. No longer believe the lies. And you know, when we're in those moments, we all have been, when we're feeling down and discouraged, he's our strength. We don't have to try to muster up enough faith to believe either. We can say, Father, Jesus, you're my strength. Help me to believe what you say and not the accusations of the enemy. You have protected me from the evil one. This has been already done. You have guarded me from the evil one. You have disarmed him. He has nothing on me. That is the most amazing thing to me. I mean, just think about the, the, the adulterous woman. The devil had nothing on her. When Jesus said, I do not condemn you, where are your accusers? She said, you're all gone, Lord. Didn't she? The enemy had been disarmed. This woman had been condemned to die from everybody around her. The law said she deserved to die. But the father guarded her from the accusation of the enemy by what was going to be accomplished through the death and resurrection of Jesus. And Jesus spoke it out. Woman, which meant endeared one, highly esteemed one. That's what he spoke into this woman's heart. Highly esteemed one. The word woman there, if you look it up in the Greek, it means highly esteemed one. I mean, wow. The love of the Father, the love of Jesus. To look at someone like that and then for us to understand that kind of love so that when we see somebody in that kind of mess, we as children and sons of God say, I do not condemn you. You're loved. You're valuable. You're highly esteemed by the Father. He guarded us from the evil one. And when we understand that, the enemy won't be able to use us anymore to accuse and condemn other people. He, he asked us, to, he asked the Father to do that, to keep us in the name, to keep us in him, and to guard us from the accusations so that we could be one. So that no matter what you're going through or what I'm going through, you're no better than me and I'm no better than you. You're no more valuable than me, and I'm no more valuable than you. Whether you've done something bad this day and I did something good, we're both just as righteous because it's not our righteousness. This is a gift that's been given. And I know that's hard to understand, but it, we either have his righteousness or we have filthy rags. There isn't no... That's it. You have filthy rags righteousness... <laughs> Or you have the righteousness of the king of kings. And that righteousness is a gift. It does not come because we've done everything right. The thing that makes it so beautiful and so valuable and so precious is that we have it even when we fail. Even when we're in a mess. Even when we find ourselves drowning in something really bad. The Father and the Son says, I do not condemn you. 
I am your righteousness. I am the one who makes you holy. I am love. That's what's going to change a world, right? What the world needs now is love, sweet love. Because we're all searching for it. And it's all found in the Father and in the Son and in us. Because we are the love family. We've been brought into the love family. And the love family does not accuse and condemn each other. The love family lifts each other up. Just as Jesus lifted that woman up that day when she was caught in the act of adultery. Just as Jesus lifted that Samaritan woman up when everybody else had rejected her. That's what we do. Because we're in his name. We are just like him. We've been made one. And the Father and the Son was showing us not only who he is, but who we are as being made one with them. Praise you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. In 1 John 5, 19, it says, We know that we are children of God and that the world around us is under the control of the evil one. And what did Jesus pray for us? That he would guard us, keep us from the evil one. So what does this mean to me in the understanding of what we just talked about? There's a whole world around us is under the accusation of the enemy. The whole world around us, in the heart of mankind, the Bible says all men were under condemnation. Do you know what that means? All men don't think they're good enough. All men. Even though when you look at people that seem to have a facade, seem like they got it all together, if they haven't found their identity in Jesus, they're still striving to be good enough. They're still trying to get that high position. You know, whatever job they may have, they're trying to be the top. Is it not true? Whatever friends, they're trying to get in the, into the popular group because they want to be approved of. This is the world around us. It, 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 it starts from the, the time, I mean, from the time I went into school, I can remember thinking, do they like me? Oh, no, maybe they don't like me. They didn't talk to me or they said something mean about me. The whole world around us is under the accusation of the evil one. And until we understand that Jesus, the Father, guarded us and protected us so that we don't have to live under the accusation of the evil one. And when we become free, we're used to set other people free. I think that is the most amazing thing because I know when I used to live under the accusation of the enemy because I didn't believe or understand really what happened on the cross, I was used by the enemy to accuse and judge and condemn other people. We all are. I'm just admitting it. I'm just willing to stand up here and admit it, but I know every single one of you did the same thing. And you know what? There's no condemnation. There is no condemnation. And when you know that you're kept in his name, that you've been made righteous and holy and just, you can admit when you're wrong. (laughs) Because it doesn't change who you are. I did that wrong thing. And I shouldn't have did it, and I'm sorry. But Father, thank you that you made me righteous. Help me and empower me to walk in righteousness. See how you can live? Same thing when somebody else falls. You can say to them, that's not who you are. You may have failed. You may have done something wrong. But that is not who you are. You are holy. You are righteous. And you are good. That lifts people up out of their condemnation, just like Jesus lifted us up out of ours. And that's how we all become, that's how we all live in the manifestation of oneness. Because in the same way that we would want to be unconditionally loved when we failed miserably. We have the power to unconditionally love when somebody else has failed miserably. Wow. 
And so now when I live in the love of Jesus and I understand that I still make mistakes at times and he doesn't change his opinion of me, guess what? That empowers me to look at you and no matter what I hear, I think you're wonderful. I think you're good. And if I get an opportunity, I'll tell you so. That is living the high life. The life of God, eternal life. The quality of life that the Father gives. The quality of life that the Father has. He's given to us in Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Okay, we're going to finish this prayer. Thank you, Jesus. Jesus gave us his glory. John 17, 20 through 26. I do not ask on behalf of these alone, but for those who who believe in me through their word. So Jesus is covering everybody who will ever believe on his name in this prayer. So that they may all be one. Even as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you sent me. The glory which you have given me, I have given to them, so that they may be one just as we are one. I in them and you in me, that they may be perfected in unity, so that the world may know that you sent me and love them even as you have loved me. Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me be with me where I am, so that they may see my glory which you have given me, for you loved me before the foundation of the world. O oh, righteous Father, although the world has not known you, yet I have known you, and these, and these have known that you sent me, and I have made your name known to them, and will make it known, so that the love with which you loved me may be in them, and I in them. And I'm going to read that from the Amplified Bible, verse 16, I mean not verse 16, verse uh, 26, because it's just so beautiful again. John 17, 26 in the Amplified Bible, Jesus is praying, I have made your name known to them and revealed your character and your very self, and I will continue to make you known that the love which you have bestowed upon me may be in them, felt in their hearts, and that I myself may be in them. The whole desire, heart, beat of the Father is that we would know that we are loved and that we would live as one with him. The whole heartbeat of the Father. How religion has painted him so dark, and yet the whole heartbeat of the Father is that we might know him through his Son and that his love might be experienced in our heart. That we might live and breathe knowing that we are beloved children of the Most High God. I love when you think about this prayer, again, the central focus, the central heartbeat is that we would be reconciled to the Father, that we would be one with Him and one with each other. And that word one means one. It just means one. And, and if you read a little bit more into it, one and the same. It means that the same nature that the Father has, the same character that the Father and the Son has, they've given to us. Jesus said, I've given them the same glory that you gave to me. And that glory is this. I know you've heard it before. We're going to read it again. Glory comes from the word doxa. It means opinion, judgment, view. In the New Testament, it's always a good opinion concerning one, resulting in praise, honor, and glory. The nature and acts of God in self-manifestation, what he essentially is and does, the character of God expressed through Christ to and through believers. The character of God, the character of God expressed through Christ. How's that go? Through Christ to and through believers. 
It's the good opinion of the father. The good opinion the father had of the son. What did he say about the son? You are my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Did he not say that? That was his view. That was his opinion of the son. And that same view and opinion, judgment that the father had of the son, the son gave to us. So the Father looks at all of us every single day, all day long, regardless of your actions, because it's a gift, and a gift is not earned. It's just given. And he looks at you all day long and says, you are my beloved son, you are my beloved daughter, and I am well pleased with you. This is my gift to you. The same glory that he gave to Jesus, that he is righteous and holy and pure and approved, is the same glory he gave to us. We have the same righteousness. And, I, and this, this is what I receive most out of this prayer. This is what's changed my life out of the, the most out of this. Number one, it has just made me realize I don't have to strive anymore. I don't have to strive to be righteous or good anymore. I am good because I am in Christ. And when I embrace that truth that I am good, that I am qualified, that the Father loves me, and that whatever I need, he's there and he is to me, then I am completely free in my heart to see you the same way. Because if it's a gift to me, it's a gift to you. So this prayer, I mean, if you really can see it as a, the beautiful glory of God that it is, is we are one with the Most High. We have the same nature and character He gave to us as a gift. The glory that the Father gave to the Son, the Son gave to us so that... We may be one, no longer defining ourselves by our behavior, by our circumstances, by what somebody else thinks of us. No longer defining ourselves by the world, no longer being controlled by the evil one. We have become one. That's our identity. And when we believe it, we will live in peace with God and with each other. Isn't that amazing? What happened on the cross at Calvary is Jesus forgave all our sins. He washed us free from all guilt and condemnation, protected us from the accusations of the enemy so that we could be made righteous and holy in him. And Live out of that and see each other that way. That's what it means to be one. When you look at somebody else and you're not seeing them as more valuable than you, not better than you, but you're seeing them as one in Christ. You are one in Christ and I am one in Christ. And this glorious life that we've come to live in this world is to live in, that live in the Father's love, let his love and his view and his opinion of us soak every cell of our bodies so that the only thing that comes out when we open our eyes is the love of the Father towards all of us, all of those around you, regardless of what they're doing that's bad, regardless of their bad mistakes, regardless of what mess they've gotten themselves in, when we live in the name of our Father, then we will give that encouragement, that identity, that love to those around us. And people will rise up out of their messes. They'll rise up out of their bad decisions. They'll rise up out of their mistakes and they'll live the glorious, righteous life that the Father and the Son's plan from the beginning of time was for us to live. In peace with him 
and in peace with each other. Isn't that beautiful? If we're having a struggle, you think, with one, if a person in our lives, if we're having a struggle, a bad opinion, a negative judgment, do you know what the answer is? It's not to go, oh, I'm so bad. That's not the answer. The answer is to go focus on Jesus and find out, reminded, be reminded of who you are and that your righteousness is a gift and that you're loved and accepted and valued. Because when you live in that, that's what comes out. You can always know where your own heart is by the way you view others. Woo! And then there's no condemnation. There is no condemnation. When I notice I'm having a struggle with somebody, when I notice my heart is not having a good opinion of someone, I'm not, I don't live in condemnation. I'm being honest with you. I don't live in condemnation. I know that's not who I am, and I know I need my Father's help. I know I need Jesus' strength, so I just go to him. I just run to that throne of grace one more time. I say, Father, do your work in my heart. Help me to see where I'm not seeing myself the way you see me. Because you know how the Father sees us? As people who love, as people who accept as people who approve and bring in, you know, love people. That's how he sees us, because well, guess what? We're just like him. And when he looks at us, he sees himself. And he's not going to condemn us when we act badly. And when we understand that, we won't condemn others when they act badly. We just need to be loved on. We just need to be reestablished. We just need to remember who we are. We are one with the Father. We're one with the Son, and that makes us one with each other. Amen? Amen. I'm so excited to share with you about the release of our new Because of Jesus ministry app. When you open the app, you'll find our home page with our main content. For example, simply click Watch Weekly Broadcast, and you'll be able to watch or listen to each week of my current Bible study on my YouTube ministry channel. You can join us live every Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. Central, or listen anytime after it's aired at your convenience. You can even click cast to your TV on the video of each week's message and lead a home Bible study with a group of friends. By clicking Bible study notes, you will find the notes or book that goes with the current weekly Bible study. One of the most exciting features is by simply clicking on audio or video Bible study series, you can listen to all the Bible studies I've taught over the last 10 years. Every CD and DVD series in our online bookstore is now available to listen to or watch for free. That's $1,100 worth of free products just by downloading the app. Click Resources and New Releases, and you can purchase any Bible study or book in our ministry online bookstore. Click the Women of Grace icon, and you can watch the Women of Grace TV programs, register to attend a conference, listen to the conference messages, connect with us through email sign up, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, or Twitter. Click Donate to easily support the ministry of Because of Jesus. Simply enter the amount you want to give and choose the one-time donation or become a monthly partner. This ministry app is made available by the continual support of the partners of Because of Jesus. I pray it is a blessing to you. Hi everyone, thank you for joining me today for Bible study. If you were blessed by today's message, I encourage you to subscribe to this channel and click the notification bell so that you will be notified every time new content is uploaded. Have a blessed day.